For me, as for millions of black Americans, there is a special dimension to our national crisis. We are not only caught up in all the evils of contemporary society, we are its lowest and most deprived component. For most of us, this is not a society of abundance, but a society of want. We are not newly victimized by the loss of identity and alienation. We have suffered an imposed heritage of exclusion and frustration for generations. Our future is doubly bleak as we face the unabated racism and deepened deprivation reserved for black Americans. It is extraordinary how well poverty has been concealed in the United States. For 25 years or more, government leaders have boasted of economic progress and the miracles of production the nation accomplished. Yet few people have heard the groans of 35 million poor, black and white. Black youth are commonly depicted today as dangerous, carrying firebombs in their hands and hatred in their hearts. Who noticed before the fact that their hands were idle, their pockets empty, their hopes frustrated, and their hearts broken by indifference and contempt? Everyone is aware that a relatively few young Negroes have resorted to violence. But how many know that the unemployment rate for Negro youth in major urban centers has soared between 35 and 50 percent? They live in squalor in slums. They are cheated in education. They cannot hope for normal married lives. And they can expect more disease and earlier death than their white counterparts. To be a Negro in the United States is to be the victim of a system of deprival in a context of personal humiliation. I do not speak impersonally. I was reared in second-class citizenship and have known the sting of humiliation in countless days of my life. The Poor People's Campaign in Washington was conceived by my late husband and the staff of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference as America's last hope to deal with the twin problems of racism and poverty. The poor in this nation are entitled to a job or an income. Few people realize that our present tax and welfare structure is such as to encourage the wealthy to speculate and the poor to vegetate. If a rich man wants to speculate, he is encouraged by preferential capital gains and loss provisions, which give him a 25% cushion against losses and take less than half as much of him on his normal earnings. But if a poor man on relief take a part-time job, he had until very recently to pay 100% tax on his earnings in the shape of dollar-for-dollar dollar reduction in his relief allowance. Even now, after a belated reform in the welfare system, a poor man on relief, after his first $30 a month in extra earnings, must turn back to the Treasury 70 cents on the dollar, while the rich man need pay the Treasury only 25 cents of every dollar he, he wins on the market, even when his normal income tax rate is more than 50 percent. Such is the topsy-turvy morality of the internal revenue laws. Our Congress passes laws which subsidize cooperation farms, oil companies, airlines, and houses for suburbia. But when they turn their attention to the poor, they suddenly become concerned about balancing the budget and cut back on funds for Head Start, Medicare, and mental health appropriations. The most tragic of these cuts is the welfare section to the Social Security Amendment, which freezes federal funds for millions of needy children who are desperately poor but who do not receive public assistance. It forces mothers to leave their children and accept work or training, leaving their children to grow up in the streets 
as tomorrow's social problems. The accented oppression of the Negro has given rise to a difference in the demands and goals of Negro students from those of white students. Negroes have a quantitative demand. Negroes have quantitative demands. Their emphasis is on jobs and opportunities to ensure elementary survival and progress. But they also have qualitative demands. And here the most hopeful alliance is forged between black and white. For the white student, already possessing the material advantages, puts perhaps greater emphasis on freedom from psychological taboos, participation in decision making, and creative restructuring of the social system. Each is legitimate and complements the other. I am optimistic about today's student. He is a vital force and on the whole a socially constructive one. No other white group in our society is as relatively free of racist poison and materialistic greed. No other group is more committed and its implacable hostility to the terrible war we are fighting against a small and outclassed people. The generation gap is a positive thing if it separates evil ide ideologies and customs of the past from the freedom spirit that animates much of the contemporary student movement. The young understand this society better than their elders think and better perhaps even than their elders themselves. They listen to the preachments of authority on behalf of order against violence, and they know that the order evoked has been the very order which has done systematic violence to the poor and the colored for centuries. That violence is still being done today in obviously cruel as well as in subtle ways. And so I must say that many of the young feel as I do, that official responses to the frightful and to the personally painful assassinations of these past months have been inadequate. Has not power heard the grim tidings, the anguish from the ghettos, the rural slums, the battlefields abroad, the violence which periodically shocks us in a reflection of the violence to which we have become immune. It is a reflection of the violence our media celebrate. It is, I say, with all due respect to the office of the President of the United States, that even intense prayer and a new commission of notables will not ease the violence in our lives. <laughs> 